Great to see so many people here. And uh, I'll just so you all know, it's being filmed, so anyone you know who wants to see it afterwards, they'll be able to. Um, we are very incredibly honoured to have Robert Mervis with us. Um, as many of you will know, he's just been announced to be the next Chief Rabbi of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, um, which makes it even more exciting that he's been able to come today. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about his experiences as, uh, as Chief Rabbi of Ireland. Um, he was very much involved in the peace process uh, during the Troubles and uh, was able to get a, a different uh, slant on the whole experience being involved in the, the Jewish community. And it's, it's not normally looked at, the, the minorities that existed at the same time as the two who were prominent, but it obviously had an effect on the entire society. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rabbi Mervis, and uh, afterwards he'll be happy to take questions. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Lovely to be here. Thank you very much, Abigail, for your warm welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I accepted this invitation it was something like half a year ago, not realizing how busy I would be at the present time. Uh, but I must say I'm delighted to discover Heathrock College, which seems to be a, a lovely gem here within the University of London. And uh, the actual reason why I said yes to Abigail was because there is a family connection that we share. And uh, I very much appreciate her brilliant leadership here of the small but significant JSOC that exists here on campus. And congratulations for organizing this event and everything else that you do, which is absolutely wonderful. I earlier on had the pleasure of uh, being welcomed to lunch by the principal, uh, Reverend Holman, and it was a lovely opportunity uh, to meet with him and senior members of staff. And also, I'm very pleased that uh, Rabbi Broder, the senior London chaplain, has come along today together with uh, the president of, uh, I think it's JSOC, Alex and, and others. So uh, all brilliant to see you all and to have you here today. When it comes to the Jewish community of Ireland, which I'll be speaking about, and then at question time, please, you can pose any questions you wish to me on any subject you wish, so it can broaden out to the way that uh, you would like. I had the uh, privilege of being a rabbi in Dublin from 1982 to 1992 and we arrived in Dublin at a time when I was just 25 years old ready to take on my first congregational uh, pulpit and that was to be the rabbi of the Dublin Hebrew congregation the Adelaide Road Shul and then some two and a half years later I was appointed as chief rabbi of Ireland so I was 28 years old when I became the chief rabbi and yet Ireland had had a bit of a history of young chief rabbis. Lord Jakubowicz, who was chief rabbi of Ireland from 1949 to 1959, was 29 years old when he became chief rabbi, as was Rabbi David Rosen, who was my predecessor there. And interestingly, uh, when Lord Jakubowicz came to Ireland to be chief rabbi, a condition was placed on his appointment. At that time, he wasn't yet married. And he was told that he could become chief rabbi on condition that he would marry within a year of taking up his post. <laughs> so in an instant, he became the most eligible Jewish man in the world. And uh, he uh, was able to marry the most outstanding woman, who was uh, Emily, uh, later to become Lady J. And uh, they were married at a time when he was already the chief rabbi of Ireland. Now, it was Lord Jakubowicz who once said something quite memorable with regard to the numbers of Jews in Ireland. You know, people visit the Jewish country where there are Jewish people and they say, you know, the favorite question is, how many Jews are here? Is there anti-Semitism? Uh, what is the future, etc.? So with regard to the number of Jewish people, at its height, the Jewish community reached around about 4,700 um, in post-war times and then started to diminish somewhat. Um, when Lord Jakubowicz was once asked how many Jews are there in Ireland, this is how he put it. He said 95% of the Irish population are Catholic, 5% are Protestant, and I'm the chief rabbi of the rest. <laughs> now, <laughs> that rest has nonetheless had a significant role 
in Irish life. Uh, in the Irish Constitution, uh, the rights of the Jewish community were enshrined, and the Jewish faith was mentioned as a state-acknowledged faith. And as a result, there has always been a very strong Jewish representation. So as chief rabbi of Ireland, I found that I was always officiating at the St. Patrick's Day Parade at all state occasions. Um, I was part of the uh, planning committee to plan for the uh, service of induction for President Mary Robinson. I officiated at her service of installation by reading a psalm. Uh, I suppose that would be analogous to the Chief Rabbi of Great Britain uh, participating in the uh, coronation of a king here. Um, and uh, in Ireland that was fully accepted that the Chief Rabbi had a role to play in public life and the nation as a whole warmed to me, not because of me personally but because of the role that I had and uh, uh, to the Jewish community at large. Now within the political life, uh, during my time there were three Jewish TDs, Trochtadola, members of the Irish Parliament. You had Ben Briscoe who was a member of Fianna Fáil, who also uh, had the honour of being Lord Mayor of Dublin during Dublin's millennium year. And he was the second Jewish person to become Lord Mayor of Dublin. The first was his father, Bobby Briscoe. Then there was Mervyn Taylor, who was the leader of the Labour Party, later to become a cabinet minister. And there was Alan Shatter, um, the only remaining TD today, member of the Fine Gael Party, and today he's the Minister of Justice in the Irish government. And the Jewish TDs, because there were three at the time representing the three main parties, that would indicate to you the fact that the Jewish community wasn't solidly behind any particular political party or outlook or view. And that certainly reflected the ways of the Jews of all Ireland. Of course, looking at Ireland as a whole, the strongest community traditionally has been Dublin. There's always been a smaller community but a strong one in Belfast, an even smaller one in Cork, and then a tiny one in Limerick. And in fact, while I was in Ireland, the only connection I had with Limerick was my fight to save the Jewish cemetery in Limerick because that's all that remained. And fortunately, the uh, Limerick Corporation was just incredible in donating funds to guarantee that the Jewish, the tiny Jewish cemetery would be looked after in perpetuity. And so I found throughout the country, in all of my experiences, enormous warmth, and people would go the extra mile to ensure that the Jewish community uh, would feel at home and would be appreciated. Within the community itself, we had a very strong infrastructure a Jewish day school, both primary school and secondary school, uh, full kashrut facilities, shechita, which we had in Ireland, and uh, old age home, Maccabi sports club, and so on. Today, it's a shadow of the past, but nonetheless, there is still a strong community in Dublin, uh, and a much smaller community in Belfast. Now, Belfast officially comes under the British chief rabbinate. However, because of the geographical proximity, uh, we found that the Dublin and Belfast communities worked hand in hand, and consequently, I often visited Belfast and I got to know many people there. When it comes to the troubles, I could actually answer the question of, well, what role did the Jewish community have in the troubles? I could answer it with two words, and that is... Uh, Let's, let's work out how to put this, uh, no connection, right? Basically, when it came to a question of the Catholics or the Protestants, we were on the side of peace. Because the community did not show any strong attachment or affinity for one side or the other. And this is a bit unusual. Usually you would find Jewish people throughout the world taking the side of certain values, usually taking a liberal line, fighting for human rights, supporting the underdog, whereas the clash in Ireland was primarily a political clash. In a secondary manner, it was a religious clash. But you couldn't actually say that one side had the moral strength over the other, and as a result, Jewish people would need, by nature, to identify with one side as opposed to the other. 
what I found absolutely fascinating was, and now I'm going to generalize, that the Jewish community in Dublin supported the Catholics and the Jewish community in Belfast supported the Protestants. Why is that the case? Well, I think it was pragmatic. You know, Lord Jacobo had said 95% of those living in the Republic are Catholics, so we identified with the government of the day and uh, with the outlook of the day. And in Belfast it was very different. The Jewish community there identified with the loyalists um, and their outlook. I recall how on many occasions the Irish government would seek the views of the Jewish community and the Taoiseach of the day, that's the Prime Minister of the day, uh, would seek my involvement and leading up to the Anglo-Irish Accords which uh, came to their conclusion in the late 1980s, the Taoiseach Garrett Fitzgerald consulted with me and when ultimately the uh, Dublin government and uh, Her Majesty's government entered into the Accords I decided to issue a public statement congratulating the two governments. And as soon as that statement had been aired on the news, I received a call from one of the leaders of the Jewish community in Belfast, who was deeply disappointed. And he said, I can't believe you issued such a statement. Do you not realize, he said, how damaging this accord will be to the loyalist cause? And, you know, we respected each other for taking different sides. Uh, but it didn't amount to anything of a very contentious nature. And by and large, the two communities worked very well together. There were hardly any Jewish people at all who actually played a role in the troubles, in the front lines of the troubles. Um, in Belfast, over all the years, uh, there was one Jewish person who was killed. Ronnie Appleton was a QC who uh, was involved in many terrorist trials and he had very strong protection at all time. Asher Siv was a lawyer in Dublin who on a number of occasions acted as the defense lawyer for some IRA terrorists. But beyond that, our communities were indeed hardly involved. We were on the side of peace. Uh, we prayed for peace, we wanted to promote peace, and uh, we really kept out of the whole issue. Now, I personally experienced tension on some of my visits uh, to Northern Ireland. I recall on one occasion in particular, I was passing through Ulster in order to reach Donegal, which is uh, in the northwest of, uh, of the island of Ireland, and it's actually just outside of Ulster, it's part of the Republic, but the quickest way to get there from Dublin was to cut across Ulster. and. Uh, so I needed to cross the border at two points. And the reason why I was going to Donegal was that at that time, our chief rabbinate was supervising the production of some herring products for export to Israel. And uh, that's why I needed to go and inspect the herring plant. So I arrived at the border point. Uh, I was used to having the barrel of a gun put literally to my face through the, uh, the front door window. That was regular. And then on this occasion, the, uh, the soldier said to me, uh, and what is the purpose of you crossing the border? So I said, I'm a rabbi, and I'm going to inspect a fish plant. There was a pause, and he said, never heard that before. Come out immediately. <laughs> and they thoroughly searched the whole card. And, you know, I was a highly suspicious individual. But I didn't have um, anything quite like the treatment of the B'nai Kiva Madrid who was traveling from Dublin to Belfast to lead a Shabbaton in the Belfast community, and he was taking with him a crate of wine. And you know on the Carmel one and some of the bottles it says, for sacramental purposes only, and that's for the customs officials to know that that's why the wine is being transferred. Anyway, so uh, he reached the border post, they opened the booth and they saw this wine. The soldier said, what's all that for? He said, this is for sacrificial purposes. So, <laughs> having heard that, uh, he was treated with uh, much suspicion. Now, living in the Republic of Ireland was a real treat for myself, my wife, and our five children. Uh, our children thrived as a family. It was just such a lovely place to live in. The Irish people are such delightful individuals, uh, very laid back uh, uh, culture and society, exceptionally friendly, and uh, 
It was there that we made lifelong connections with people both within the Jewish community and uh, within general society. And, you know, wherever we are as Jews, we are part of our environment. And there was one particular experience uh, which highlighted this for me. Uh, all of our children went to Montessori play schools before they then came to the Jewish primary school. And in Montessori play schools, they take pride in introducing young children to uh, the various disciplines of learning at an advanced level for their age. So on one Friday afternoon, I came to collect our son, Noam, who was then two and a half from school, and the teacher with much pride said to me, Noam knows the names of the continents. We've been teaching him the continents today. You check him out. You'll see. He knows the names. Oh, Noam was beaming with pride. So that was great at the Friday evening table that night, surrounded by guests. I said, OK, Noam. Um, you know the continents? He said, yes. And I said, uh, okay, let's go through them. Uh, Afri, he said, K, A, he said, Je, Austre, he said, Lea, Yo, he said, Rup. And then I said, Ameri, and he said, Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that highlighted for me the fact that wherever you are, you're part of society, and your family learns from the environment in which you are part. And at the same time, we as a Jewish community, have a responsibility to make an impact on our surroundings and to bring the beauty of our tradition and our values to be appreciated uh, by society in order that we hopefully will be a veritable light unto the other nations. Um, in Cork, there was a relatively small Jewish community, but Gerald Goldberg in his day was the Lord Mayor of Cork, and he made a monumental contribution to Cork uh, city life, I'd say well beyond any other Cork citizen. And uh, in its uh, heyday, Cork actually had two synagogues, came down to one, and when I was the chief rabbi of Ireland, there were 51 Jewish souls living in County Cork. Today, oh, there must be just about 10 or 15 or so. But I remember on a visit to Cork, I was in a, a taxi, and uh, the driver was taking me wherever I was going to, and we started to chat. Oh, you're the chief rabbi. Oh, the Jewish community. So I said to him, how many Jewish people do you think there are in Cork? He says, oh, 10 or 20,000. And uh, <laughs> I said, why you say? He said, they're, they're just leave it leading us in. You know, they're all over the place. Uh, there's Goldberg, and there's Rose Hill, and there's this and that. And sure enough, it, it reminded me of um, the visit that I once paid to Swaziland, because I was born and grew up in South Africa, and I actually, at the time, had family in Swaziland, and uh, we took some of our holidays in Swaziland. And in Swaziland at the time, there were 10 Jewish families, and that included the Israeli ambassador and members of his staff. <laughs> but the king of Swaziland at the time, King Zabuza III, once made a speech uh, at the Israeli embassy, and he congratulated the Jewish community of over 5,000 souls in Swaziland for what they were doing, whereas really, literally just a handful. But it so happens that wherever Jewish people are around the world, we have the capacity to reach a certain level of potential in order to make our mark. And... Uh, one would hope that the mark would always be a positive one, because that's why God chose us to be a chosen people, in order that we should make a positive impact on our surroundings. And it's always very sad if, God forbid, there is a negative impact that is made due to the extent to which we are noticed wherever we go. So our Irish experiences uh, were of enormous significance. Um, and most of all, the Jewish community uh, took advantage of the uh, prestige that it was given and the extent to which government and local officials wanted to guarantee that the Jews would live in a free and welcoming manner. And in that respect, I recall an anecdote which took place just before we arrived in Ireland. Pope John Paul II paid his first a papal visit to Ireland in 1981. And uh, on that occasion, there was enormous excitement in Ireland. And the key element of his visit was 
a Saturday morning mass which took place in Phoenix Park, which is a central city park, I suppose equivalent to Hyde Park in London. And over one million people attended the mass. And if you visit Phoenix Park today, you'll still see a very large white cross at the spot where the Pope stood. Now, at a time when there were just under three million people living in Ireland, for there to be just over one million people at a mass, that's quite a number of people. And uh, what uh, the Dublin City Corporation did for the occasion was, they closed the whole inner city area to traffic. Because they realized that if it would be open to traffic, it would just be an absolute standstill. And they also wanted to encourage people to engage in what we would call an aliata rega, a pilgrimage, so that they would park on the outside and get public transport outside, and then people would walk up to Phoenix Park for this very special occasion. Now, it so happened that the Adelaide Road Synagogue, the so-called cathedral synagogue of the Jewish community, uh, which is in the heart of Dublin, was within that cordoned off area. And this was the Saturday morning mass. And what that meant was that Jewish people would not be able to drive to synagogue on Saturday morning. So, uh, by the way, we're not allowed to drive on Saturday morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, but nearly everybody coming to that synagogue did drive on Saturday morning. So what they did was, they wrote a letter of complaint um, to the uh, civic authorities of Dublin, and they said, it's not right. You know, for the sake of the freedom of Catholic citizens uh, to have the Mass by the Pope, we are being denied the opportunity to get to our synagogue on our Sabbath. What was the response? You are right. So special stickers were provided to members of the Adelaide Road congregation so that they could place them uh, on their cars and the policemen in all the corner of areas were told that they should allow those cars to go in on the Saturday morning in order that Jewish people could come to Shulan Shabbos, to the synagogue, in order to pray on Saturday. Um, so it's uh, amusing in that they weren't as religious as they might hopefully have been, but at the same time, they took pride in their religion, wanted to have the right to come to synagogue, and were given that right within Ireland. Now, apart from the Jewish people, Ireland is the only country which speaks of a strong diaspora. Uh, and there are numerous Irish people around the world, uh, even to the extent that you don't have to be Irish to be Irish, according to the lyrics of one of the favorite songs. Um, and through being in Ireland, it had a significant impact on us as a family to the extent that we all took out Irish citizenship and uh, most members of our family support Ireland in all sports encounters to this day. Um, and we have a genuine love for the people. In more recent times, um, there has been a significantly anti-Israel tone and element within Irish society, which is lamentable. Um, but at the same time, the Jewish community continues to thrive. And for me personally, I was privileged to be part of a community and to lead a community through which I was able to learn an enormous amount uh, which has enriched me and which has enabled me to go on to other things in my life. I'm going to stop over here. Please feel free to ask questions about Ireland, the Jewish community there, my experiences there, or things closer to home uh, if you want to avail of this opportunity to pose questions to me. Um, and if anyone wants to ask something, stick your hand up, and I will try to get to everyone so that the rabbi can answer your questions. Um, good afternoon, Rabbi. My name is Philip Gardner. I'm a student at King's College London, so just up the road. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'm going to limit myself to one uh, in deference to the chair, um, which is, uh, as someone who isn't Jewish, as a Protestant living in the UK, but who's anxious to make sure that the Jewish community feels as welcome as you were just describing they do in Ireland. Uh, what are the major things you think people of other faiths can do to help the Jewish community feel safe, uh, loved and wanted in the UK? Okay, that's a brilliant question. Did everybody hear it? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much um, for, for posing the question in that way. And um, 
you can respond um, in a number of ways. First is at an interpersonal level. The second is through various organizations. So at an interpersonal level, again, if I share with you an anecdote from our Dublin days, there was a tradition that on his first day in office, the Lord Mayor of Dublin would present himself to three people, to the uh, Protestant Archbishop, to the Catholic Archbishop, and to the Chief Rabbi. So when I became Chief Rabbi, I was informed of this, and uh, I said, I don't just want the Lord Mayor to come over for five or ten minutes. He and his wife should come over to our house for tea. So uh, that's what we put into operation. And um, Lord Mayors of Dublin uh, in, uh, invariably are government ministers who double up in these two capacities. It's just the way the system worked. So one year there was a fellow called Jim Tunney, who at the same time was the Minister of Health and Sport in the Irish government. And uh, he came to our house, and when he arrived, he said, I hope you'll excuse me, because in half an hour's time, I have to leave. There is an important vote in the door, and I have to uh, go to be there for the, dirt, for the vote. Anyway, my wife had prepared some lovely cheesecake, and he was having piece after piece of this cheesecake. And after half an hour, his driver came in and said, we have to go. He said, no, 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 I need another piece of cheesecake. And <laughs> no, 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 no. Anyway, this guy ate more than half the cheesecake. And, <laughs> And we had such a lovely time, it was brilliant. And then he made it for the vote just by the skin of his teeth. Later that year, I hosted the biannual uh, conference of the International Council of Christians and Jews. And we had the heads of Council of Christians and Jews from around the world, and he hosted a reception that I asked him to host in the Mansion House in Dublin. And he got up and he said in his speech, ladies and gentlemen, you don't need conferences and uh, you don't need to discuss theology. All you need for Christians and Jews to get on together is cheesecake. <laughs> so I think there's a lot to go for just socializing together, showing friendship. Um, it's in this context that next week I'm, I'm arranging a, a significant first time event of Muslims and Jews in my synagogue uh, because we need to break down barriers. We need to demystify impressions about each other. Uh, every human being is created in the image of God. We need to extend our love and our recognition uh, for one another to one and all. And that's the only way that society is genuinely going to move forward. And therefore, socially, we need to interact in a healthy manner with cheesecake or whatever. But then, in addition, there are various societies and organizations, such as the Council of Christians and Jews, the Three Faiths Forum. Uh, we're trying to encourage uh, new organizations, <coughs> Jews and Muslims as well, uh, to come about. And I would encourage as many of you as possible to join these groups and uh, to add to efforts which are being genuinely undertaken in order to increase understanding and dialogue and mutual respect. Um, and then I suppose it's a question of responding to the issues of the day and having a voice of sanity uh, out there uh, on the public square because sometimes extremism tends to grab hold of the consciousness of the public and it's an enormous pity and we need that voice of sanity, that voice of love, of consideration and compassion and tolerance really to triumph over all the other voices that exist out there. So I think those are some of the ways that, that, that you can work on. Thank you. Rabbi, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, I recognize much of the environment that you've described and quite a bit of the situation. Um, I was a member during the time that you were at the Adelaide Road Synagogue of the Adelaide Road Presbyterian Church in right. Dublin. And, uh, and for the benefit of others, I think you, you, you needn't worry about customs or about uh, guns through the window uh, passing across the Irish border anymore. Um, the, 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 I recognize very much the period that you were talking about. And I think that the, the, the environment in Ireland is a very special one. And a very special one informed, I suppose, by the level of religious, uh, religious commitment that there is there. I am intrigued by the 
the description that you give, and it's something that I've been quite conscious of, this, the, as you said, the Jewish community in the Republic identifying with the, with a, with the majority there, the Jewish community in, in Belfast identifying, and how different that is, for example, uh, from a place like Italy, where in Italy, there is a very keen awareness among the religious minorities in Italy, also a, a predominantly Catholic country, of a kind of common, uh, a common front for the defense of, of religious minority values in an overwhelmingly Catholic society. What, what do you attribute the different the difference, say, for example, between Italy and Ireland, too. I, 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 I appreciate what you've, what, what, what you've said very much. I'm interested in sort of teasing apart some of the things that, that, that brought the Jewish community in Ireland to that place. Because Ireland, of course, has got a very a difficult history as well. You mentioned Limerick, and of course <coughs> Limerick was the site of some very famous pogroms in the past, so it's not... There's a dark history, too. Okay, so thank you very much for that question. I think it's not too difficult to explain, because we're speaking here about Catholics versus Protestants, or, more significantly, Loyalists versus Republicans. And something that I got to know very early on was that the battle was not primarily a religious one. It was a political one. And it so happened that Catholics were on the Republican side and Protestants were on the Loyalist side. So where you had that tension between two sides, and there was a question, who do I identify with? Um, now, we're not speaking about people who signed up for a particular side, who went to fight for a particular side. That's not what happened. We're just being about consciousness, where one's sympathies happen to lie. Um, that's not what you have in Italy. You don't, basically in Italy you've got a majority, you've got a minority. With whom are we going to identify? Are we going to support minority rights? Are we going to support liberal tendencies? Um, are we going to be critical of religion, etc.? Here in Ireland I was focusing specifically on two sides to an ongoing war and who the Jewish community was identifying primarily <coughs> with. And I think it's understandable that those in the South identifying with one side of the north with the other. With regard to wider issues, the Jewish communities of Ireland, uh, as traditionally is the case, identified with liberal values, with human rights, with human dignity, uh, with tolerance, and uh, would fight against extremism. Uh, you mentioned Limerick. Yes, in 1904, there was what was called the Limerick Pogrom. Uh, compared to pogroms in Eastern Europe, it wasn't very significant. Uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitic uh, sentiment, and on a particular Sunday, a priest uh, delivered a very anti-Semitic sermon, inciting the mobs to go out and to attack Jewish properties. And many Jewish shops were raided, fronts were, uh, were broken down, and not a single um, bit of blood was shed, but the Jewish community was so frightened by that event, they reached the obvious conclusion, that is, let's move out of here. Uh, and so that fledgling Jewish community came to an abrupt end, and as a result, the uh, Jewish cemetery in Limerick has very few uh, graves in it, because even though there was a very large community, they basically fled and left very few people behind. I think that it's a tribute to Ireland as a society that this is the only well-known instance of open anti-Semitism. You can't cite another example other than the Limerick pogrom of 1904. And probably, therefore, in terms of a historical record of anti-Semitism, Ireland tops the list in terms of the good treatment it's given to its Jewish citizens. Well, geographically moving further away, and I wonder, you talked about how, in terms of the sectarian divide, 
the Jewish community didn't take a particular position, um, except for the North South, and to make reference to. And I wonder what learning there is, other than um, wanting to strive for peace, that there is going to be for you um, in your new role in relation to the Palestinians and Israel. Okay. I, I think that's a, a parallel. I think. Okay, I think that's a, a valid question. Um, don't forget, I'm a spiritual leader. I'm not a political leader. Sometimes there are political issues uh, which come right to the heart of religion. Um, I think that in my role, um, I would cheapen my role if I would reduce my role to mere politics. But certainly, I think that faith leaders should shed. Uh, spiritual perspectives on political issues of the day. And broadly speaking, I'm proud to be a Zionist, to be a supporter of the State of Israel, uh, and at the same time uh, to believe in the human dignity of every single individual living in the Middle East, and to be somebody who not only prays for peace, but who will actively strive to contribute towards a peace process. I wonder how you will do that. <laughs> Let's wait and see. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to come back uh, on a slightly different question, which yeah. is about, um, do you think the major differences will be in terms of leadership role in the Jewish, Irish, uh, the Irish community and the Jewish community in Ireland, sorry, I'll get there in the end, yeah. which is, as you say, very small, and a much larger, perhaps more diverse, I don't know, uh, community here in the UK. Um, how, how are you going to go about approaching that very big change? The two uh, situations are totally different. Yeah, there are some similarities, uh, of course, but here we're speaking about a very large Jewish presence. We're speaking about um, diverse entities within the Jewish community, different needs, um, different levels of priority that are given from various quarters. Uh, certainly, um, if I'm presuming that I'm going to have an easy ride, every second or third person I meet reminds me of the challenges <laughs> and wishes me good luck with a kind of twinkle in their eyes if they know and I know that uh, I'm really going to need it. Um, so uh, I think that the most important thing about leadership is that one should be honest to God and honest to oneself. You know, in our benching, in our uh, grace after meals, we say, Let us find grace and favor in the eyes of God and man. And I think that should really be our slogan for life. Let's find grace and favor, let's be popular in the eyes of God and in the eyes of people in that order. First, let's be sincere, let's do what we believe is genuinely right. Um, and let's hope that that will make us popular as well. Um, but at the end of the day, if one is seeking to win popularity on every issue from everyone, one won't be a good leader, and also one won't achieve what one sets out to do. So I know that uh, I will need to be courageous in terms of policies, outlook, and uh, to be myself and to strive to lead the community in the direction that I would like it to go, uh, even though I know that there will be many occasions on which I won't be uh, saying what will make me popular in every quarter on every occasion. We've just celebrated the festival of Purim, and at the end of the Megillah, the book of Esther, uh, the book concludes with five accolades that are given to Mordechai, who was instrumental in saving the Jews in Persia at that time. And one of those accolades is Veratsui Lerov Echav. He was popular amongst the majority of his brethren. And you ask, gosh, couldn't we say something better than that? Mm -hmm. You know, here was a man who led the Jewish people against Haman. He led them in prayer. He led them in pragmatic activity. So, Veratsui Lerovachav, he was popular amongst the majority of his brethren. But I think that's the markings of a really good leader. Because he did what he believed was right. And if he was doing what was right in the eyes of God, and was also popular amongst the majority of people, that makes him into a great man. So uh, certainly I have got my work cut out for myself. I believe very much in the authenticity of Torah law and at the same time in the importance of the, Jewish, the unity of the Jewish nation. 
tolerance towards one and all, recognition of every human being as being a precious soul created in the image of God. Um, I believe very much in what we call menschlichkeit, being gentle, being kind, being decent, and uh, trying our best within a society which has suffered so much at the hands of extremists to uh, walk along that middle golden mean, as Maimonides put it, uh, in order to seek the moderate way of life for the sake of furthering uh, uh, all of us. I know lofty ideals uh, and uh, filled with uh, noble aspirations, uh, and I hope to achieve quite a lot of that. Um, the demographic of different um, Jewish denominations in Ireland. Okay, so uh, in Ireland at the time, the Orthodox community was by far the strongest of all the communities. In Belfast and Cork, there were only Orthodox communities. In Dublin, there was an Orthodox community, which in my time had the Adelaide Road Synagogue, the Greenville Hall, which closed, the Old Age Home Synagogue, which closed, the Marzike Das, which is still open, and Terrenio, which is still open, and Adelaide Road, I think I mentioned. Uh, and there was a reform community, which continues to this day, um, and uh, working separately in the religious sphere, but together uh, in the communal sphere. So um, the reform community worked separately, had their own premises, own cemetery, um, and uh, we worked cohesively together. So that was basically the, the breakdown. Uh, not as complex uh, as you have within the UK today with Masorti, and then you've got various separate brands of uh, progressive Judaism. Um, so that's the answer to your question. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. OK. Um, I'm sure everyone has uh, taken an awful lot from that. I certainly have. I visited uh, Dublin last summer and went to the, the Adelaide Shawl and the, the Jewish Museum, but I've now got a, a more of a personal perspective on it. Um, we've got Kate has, uh, has something to present. When ordinary on this kind of thing, you'd present food or something, but it being so close to Tessa, I thought uh, okay. flowers might be so That's very nice of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.